This is the first video in a series of videos for Math 127 at Nevada State College. This pre-calculus course is more precisely described as a course in trigonometry, which is the study of triangles. As we go through this course, we're going to discover that circles play an extremely important role in our understanding of triangles. We will also look at the algebra of trigonometric functions, as this is an important preparation for calculus. Before we talk about the structure of the course, we need to take a moment to talk about Bloom's taxonomy. Bloom's taxonomy is simply a model that we can use in an educational context that helps us to understand how deeply we have learned something. At the lowest level, we simply have the ability to remember information. At the highest level, we have the ability to create new ideas built upon the ideas we've generated working our way up the chart. This course is structured towards trying to drive you to the highest levels of learning. We will do this by following the pattern of a pre-class activity to prepare you for class, followed by learning activities both in class and as homework. The activities are built upon each other, and when put together, they represent a broad understanding of the topic. The pre-class preparation consists of watching videos and completing the corresponding worksheet. The worksheet is modeled directly from the videos, so if you watch the videos, you should be able to complete the worksheet. These will generally target the lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy so that we have a foundation to build on in class. The learning activities will be about getting more practice with the ideas by putting you into new situations and asking you to use what you learned before class. If you think of math as a set of rigid rules that must be memorized and followed, then you will not be very successful at learning math. Math is much more about connecting ideas together and then communicating those connections to others. Yes, there are some mechanical things that you'll need to learn about how math operates, but the real math begins when you start trying to apply what you've learned. It's the difference between watching a sport and playing a sport. There's something different that happens when you actually do it as opposed to simply being an observer. When you reach the highest levels of understanding, you will be able to create your own problems using the concepts from the section. All of these experiences are designed to build as deep of an understanding of pre-calculus as possible, which will help set you up for success in calculus. As we begin our study of trigonometry, it is important for us to establish a bit of vocabulary. An angle is a shape formed when line segments intersect. The corner formed by the intersection is called the vertex. One of the two lines is called the initial side and the other the terminal side. We use these to decide which way we're measuring this angle. The choice of the initial side and terminal side is context dependent, and in many cases it doesn't even matter. The one case where this is extremely important is when we're drawing angles in standard position. This means that the angle is drawn on the xy plane with the vertex at the origin and the positive x-axis as the initial side. In this case, angles in the counterclockwise direction have a positive measure and angles in the clockwise direction have a negative measure. You might notice that there are multiple ways to measure an angle. For example, this angle can be measured in either the positive or negative direction. When two angles start from the same initial side and end at the same terminal side, we say that we have coterminal angles. In fact, any angle has an infinite number of ways to measure it, as we can wind our way around the angle as many times as we want and in either direction. Geometrically, there is very little reason to do this. However, we will later see that there are contexts in which this makes sense, but for now we will mostly just stick with the natural geometric angle. If the initial and terminal side are perpendicular to each other, we say that they form a right angle. If the angle is smaller than a right angle, then we say it is an acute angle. If the angle is larger than a right angle, but does not exceed the angle of a straight line, we say that it is an obtuse angle. When labeling angles, we often use lowercase Greek letters. Traditionally, we use theta, but you will also see alpha, beta, and gamma sometimes. Later on in class, we will also use capital Latin letters, specifically when we are labeling the vertices of triangles. If two angles combine together to form a right angle, we say that they are complementary angles. If two angles combine together to form a straight line, we say that they are supplementary angles. These relationships are important in trigonometry. In the next video, we will talk about ways that we can measure angles. When measuring angles, there are two primary systems that are used, degrees and radians. Most people are more familiar with degrees than radians. If you know that there are 360 degrees in a circle, 
or that a right angle is 90 degrees, then you already know about this system. You would also have seen this system if you've ever used the compass for hiking. Mathematically, degrees are an arbitrary unit of measure. Its origins date back to ancient civilizations that tended to use numbers like 12 and 60 in their number systems because those numbers have so many factors. But there's nothing inherent to angles that would lead us to this choice. Whenever you write down an angle in degrees, you must always include the degree symbol or state in words that you're giving a measurement in degrees. Mathematicians use radians far more often than degrees because radians have a meaningful geometric interpretation. The word radian is related to the word radius, which gives us a hint about its meaning. Suppose you have a circle of radius r. If you pick a point on the circle and travel a distance r around the circumference of the circle, the angle formed by your starting point, the center of the circle, and your ending point is one radian. In other words, it's the distance of one radius going around the circle. It turns out that no matter the radius of your circle, you will always get the same angle when you do this. The universality of this geometric property is among the many reasons mathematicians prefer radians. The formula for the circumference of a circle is c equals 2 pi r, where pi is a mathematical constant whose value is approximately 3.14159. In other words, if we take one full trip around the circle, we will travel a distance of 2 pi radiuses. This tells us that the angle measure of a whole circle is 2 pi radians. In the next video, we will talk about some important angles and how to convert from degrees to radians or the other way around. In the previous video, we saw that there are two systems for measuring angles. Using the system of degree measurement, the total angular measure of a full circle is 360 degrees. Using the system of radian measurement, the total angular measure of a full circle is 2 pi. You will need to become fluent in both systems. We will start this video by doing some practice with those measurements. If going around a full circle gives a measurement of 360 degrees, or 2 pi radians, then going halfway around the circle gives us a measurement of half those quantities. In other words, 180 degrees, or pi radians. If we divide that in half, we will get a quarter of a circle, which will measure 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians. If we divide this in half again, we get an eighth of a circle, which measures 45 degrees, or pi over 4 radians. If we return to the quarter circle and cut it into thirds, we will have a twelfth of a circle. These measure 30 degrees, or pi over 6 radians. The basic angles of 30 and 45 degrees, or pi over 6 and pi over 4 radians, can be used to construct the most important angles that we will encounter in this class by working our way back around the circle using multiples of these values. If we start with the 30 degree, or pi over 6 angle, we can work our way around the circle to get these measurements. If we start with the 45 degree, or pi over 4 angle, we get these measurements. If we merge these into a single circle, we get this diagram. You will need to know your way around this circle. It will become increasingly important as the semester progresses. Initially, this might seem like a lot of information, but remember that you can build these angles by just starting from the 30 or 45 degree angles. But these aren't the only angles we will encounter. We will need a general method for switching between degrees and radians. We will use the method of conversion factors to accomplish this. Every equality between two quantities can be turned into a conversion factor by creating a fraction from them, and there are two different ways to do this. Because the numerator and the denominator are both the same value, each of these fractions is equivalent to 1, and so we can multiply them without changing the values. The only trick is that we must pick the one that will make the units cancel out correctly. For example, if we're converting 105 degrees to radians, we will pick the conversion factor with degrees in the denominator so that they will cancel out. Or if we're converting 4 pi over 5 radians to degrees, we will need to pick the conversion factor with radians in the denominator. A word of caution regarding conversion factors. It is easy to get in the habit that thinking the value pi must always mean radians, and that the absence of pi must always mean degrees. You must always pay attention to the units. For example, if we're converting two radians to degrees, we must still pick the conversion factor with radians in the denominator. It may seem strange to have a pi in your degree measurement, but remember that pi is just a number, and you can always plug this into a calculator to get a decimal approximation.
The unit circle is the most fundamental object that you will need to understand in this course. It contains just about all the information about trigonometric functions that we will be using throughout the entire class. The unit circle is a circle of radius 1 centered at the origin. For any angle theta, we can draw it in standard position so that the initial side is along the positive x-axis and the vertex is at the origin. The circle will intersect the terminal side at some point that we'll call xy. Notice that by the definition of radian measure, the distance around the circle from the point 1, 0 to the point xy will be exactly theta if theta is in radians. We will use the point xy to define all six of our trigonometric functions. Here are the definitions. There are lots of relationships and alternate interpretations of these functions. We will explore those later. For now, we will just need to know that the three functions on the left are the fundamental functions that we need to understand, and the ones that are horizontally adjacent to them are just the reciprocals of the fundamental functions. To see how this works graphically, here is an image of the unit circle with grid lines drawn at every tenth. We will estimate the trigonometric functions evaluated at the angle pi over 10 radians. We start by drawing the angle in standard position. Based on the grid markings, we can estimate that the coordinate of the point of intersection is approximately 0 0.95, 0 0.3, so that the x coordinate is 0 0.95 and the y coordinate is 0.3. Based on the formulas, this will tell us that sine of pi over 10 is about 0.3 and cosine of pi over 10 is about 0.95. We can then approximate the values of the other functions using the formulas and a calculator. When working with this picture, we will also need to pay attention to the signs of the coordinates. For example, here are the values of the trigonometric functions evaluated at 140 degrees. Notice that the x-coordinate is negative, making some of these values negative. In the next video, we will learn some of the special locations on the unit circle. These are extremely important values that you will be expected to know and expected to be able to reconstruct. Recall that the unit circle is one of the ways that we can compute the values of trigonometric functions. If we draw the unit circle and draw an angle in standard position, the coordinates of the point where the terminal side intersects the unit circle gives us the values of the functions according to this chart. On the unit circle, there are some important coordinates at certain angles that you must know. In a later video, we will derive the values of this using the Pythagorean theorem, but for now we will simply learn them heuristically. We begin with the angles built around increments of pi over 2, or 90 degrees. As we work our way around the circle, we get the angles of 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi, which is coterminal with 0. The coordinates of these angles are easy to remember because they all lie on the coordinate axes. All you need to remember is that the unit circle has radius 1, and this will tell you exactly what the coordinates are for each of these angles. We will next look at the angles built around increments of pi over 4, or 45 degrees. In addition to the previous four angles, we also get pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, and 7 pi over 4. All of the new coordinates will be a plus or minus square root of 2 over 2. The signs of these coordinates will correspond to the quadrant. In the first quadrant, both coordinates are positive. In the second quadrant, the x coordinate is negative and the y coordinate is positive. In the third quadrant, both coordinates are negative, and in the fourth quadrant, the x-coordinate is positive and the y-coordinate is negative. Lastly, we will look at the angles built around increments of pi over 6, or 30 degrees. In addition to the angles we already have, we will also get pi over 6, pi over 3, 2 pi over 3, 5 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, 4 pi over 3, 5 pi over 3, and 11 pi over 6. Each of these new coordinates will either be a plus or minus one half or a plus or minus square root of three over two. You will be able to identify the proper signs by looking at the quadrant, but you also need to use some logic to figure out which is which. The important fact to remember is that the square root of three over two is greater than one half, so that when you look at the picture, you will be able to just choose the coordinates that correspond to this fact. For example, at pi over six, the x coordinate is greater than the y coordinate. So the x coordinate gets square root of three over two, and the y coordinate gets 1 half. At pi over 3, the y coordinate is now larger, so that one is square root of 3 over 2, which makes the x coordinate 1 half. This pattern continues all the way around the circle. This looks like a lot of information, and it is.
But by thinking this through and paying attention to the signs and with a little bit of practice, you can work your way around the entire unit circle and get all of these values. The points in the first quadrant are very important in this course. Recall that the coordinates are related to the sine and cosine functions. You're expected to memorize these and be able to reproduce them on command. Fortunately, it takes just a little bit of practice to get these values to stick. Notice how sine starts at zero and the numerators count up. Cosine uses the same values, but in the opposite order. This will help you keep all the numbers straight. You can also look up the sine and cosine finger trick if you're still having problems. As a side note, square root of 2 over 2 is approximately 0 0.707, and square root of 3 over 2 is approximately 0 0.866. These are useful values to know, but it's more important that you know the exact values and not the numerical approximations. In the next video, we will look more closely at these values and make a further observation about our trigonometric functions based on the unit circle. In the previous video, we obtained this unit circle, complete with coordinates for special angles. The first application of the unit circle is simply to compute the trigonometric functions for these angles. All we need to do is combine the definitions with the diagram and simply match up the coordinates with the formulas. For example, if we wanted to compute cotangent of 4 pi over 3, we first need to find the angle on the unit circle, and notice that the corresponding x coordinate is negative 1 half, and the corresponding y coordinate is negative square root of 3 over 2. Then we look at the formula and see that the cotangent is computed as x over y. So we simply plug it in and simplify to complete the calculation. Evaluating any of the six trigonometric functions at any of these angles will follow the same pattern. Identify the angle, determine the coordinates, and then plug it into the formula. Since the sine and cosine functions are defined by points on the circle, we can see that if we keep traveling around the circle, we're going to repeat the values. In fact, we know that every time the angle changes by 2 pi, we will be back at the exact same point on the circle. When something repeats on regular intervals like this, we say that it is periodic. The period is the size of the gap before it repeats. In this case, that period is 2 pi. Because we can either add or subtract 2 pi repeatedly, we get a whole collection of values that correspond to the exact same point on the circle. And since the point gives us the values of the sine and cosine functions, we would say that the sine and cosine functions are periodic with period 2 pi. Formally, we can express this relationship in the following manner. The 2 pi n combination corresponds to the increase or decrease in the angle after winding around an extra n times. And since the sine and cosine functions determine the rest of the functions, we see that they all have this property. We will see these again later on in this course, and for some of these we can actually find a shorter period, but we're not going to worry about that for now. When evaluating the trigonometric functions, this relationship allows us to change the angle by multiples of 2 pi without changing the value of the function itself. This lets us adjust the angle so that it's back between 0 and 2 pi so that we can use the angles on the unit circle diagram that we had earlier. For example, to compute cosecant of negative 7 pi over 2, we can just keep adding multiples of 2 pi until we get to a familiar value. A third application of the unit circle is to understand symmetries in the trigonometric functions. If we draw the angles plus or minus theta on the unit circle, we can see that the x-coordinates of both points perfectly line up. This is because the upper half and the lower half of the circle are just mirror images of each other. This means that if the coordinate of the upper point is xy, then the coordinate for the lower point is x negative y. We can plug this into the definitions to discover the following relationships. Notice that the cosine and secant functions are the only ones that stay the same when we use the negative angle. There are two vocabulary terms that are useful here. We say that a function f is odd if it satisfies the property f of negative x equals negative f of x. And we say that a function f is even if it satisfies the property f of negative x equals f of x. In other words, the sine, cosecant, tangent, and cotangent functions are odd, and the cosine and secant functions are even. But it's important not to get hung up in the formal mathematical definitions. The key idea is to think about the geometry of the unit circle. If you take the point on the unit circle that you get with the angle theta, then the point on the circle corresponding to negative theta is the reflection of the original point across the x-axis. This keeps the x value the same, but changes the sign on the y value. 
This picture is more important than memorizing that the cosine function is even and the sine function is odd. So far, we've been looking at the unit circle as our definition of trigonometric functions. However, there's a way to think about trigonometry using right triangles. The two end up being related to each other, but we'll hold off on making those connections for a little while and just focus on the triangles for a bit. If you have a right triangle, the two sides that make the right angle are called the legs, and the long side is called the hypotenuse. If we label one of the non-right angles as theta, then we can also name the legs by their relationship to theta. One leg is adjacent to the angle, and the other leg is opposite from the angle. Notice that this is labeled relative to the location of the angle, so that if we look at the other angle, the names will switch. The Pythagorean theorem gives us a mathematical relationship between the sides of right triangles. If a and b are the lengths of the legs, and c is the length of the hypotenuse, then a squared plus b squared equals c squared. This formula allows us to find the length of the third side of the triangle if we know just two of them. All six trigonometric functions can be defined in terms of these relationships. A mnemonic device that is often used to remember these relationships is SOHCAHTOA. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent is opposite over adjacent. Those three functions will be the primary functions that we will be working with. The other three are merely the reciprocals of these. The cosecant function is the reciprocal of the sine function, the secant function is the reciprocal of the cosine function, and the cotangent function is the reciprocal of the tangent function. These reciprocal relationships will come up when we're working with analytic trigonometry as well. Once you have these formulas, you can be given a triangle with only two sides known and can compute all six trigonometric functions relative to the angles. For example, consider this triangle. We will label the unknown side A. And then using the Pythagorean theorem, we can determine that a is equal to the square root of 40, or 2 square root 10. Relative to the angle theta, this side is the opposite side, and this side is the adjacent side. And now we just match up the picture with the definitions. It is always important to be thinking in terms of the location of the side relative to the angle. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent is opposite over adjacent and the values of cosecant, secant, and cotangent are just the reciprocals of these. Basically, all the calculations will be of this form. It doesn't matter what the numbers are, and there can even be problems where you have variables in the triangle. The most important thing to remember is that the functions establish relationships between the sides of right triangles. In the next video, we will look at special right triangles that give us the values that we used in the unit circle. There are two special right triangles that you need to know. They are usually described by their angles in degrees. They are the 45-45-90 triangle and the 30-60-90 triangle. These angles should seem familiar because we saw them when we were working with the unit circle. The 45-45-90 triangle is known as an isosceles triangle, which means that two of the sides have the same length. If we say that the legs have length 1, then the hypotenuse will have length square root of 2. The 30-60-90 triangle is actually half of an equilateral triangle, and this observation allows us to determine the side lengths. We will start with an equilateral triangle of side length 2. When we cut this in half, we can see that the short leg must have length 1. And then we can use the Pythagorean theorem to find that the length of the third side is the square root of 3. From these triangles, we can now compute the six trigonometric functions for the 30-degree, 45-degree, and 60-degree angles. There was nothing special about how we chose the side lengths. We just chose numbers out of convenience. Regardless of how we made the initial decision, we would always end up with the same ratios for the side lengths. If we repeat the same calculation, but using the variable x instead, we would get these triangles. Notice that for these triangles, you only need to know the length of one of the sides to get the length of all the sides, which is also enough to get you all six trigonometric functions. In fact, if we pick the hypotenuse length to be 1, we can fit these triangles inside of the unit circle, 
And when we do this, we can see where the special values for the unit circle came from. Those values that you memorized are actually the side lengths of right triangles that fit inside the unit circle. These connections are what make trigonometry so powerful. In the next video, we will take a deeper look at these relationships to derive some mathematical identities. In an earlier video, we mentioned that the sine, cosine, and tangent functions were the primary functions, and that cosecant, secant, and cotangent were just their reciprocals. We can rewrite these relationships without referring to the sides of triangles. Taken collectively, these formulas are known as the reciprocal identities. Even though there are six formulas, you really only need to know the first three, since you can get the others by simply taking the reciprocals. There is another collection of formulas, known as the quotient identities. These show some more of the relationships between the different trigonometric functions. And even though there are two of these, you really only need to know this one. Again, you could derive the other one by taking the reciprocal. There's one new formula that we can get by looking back at the unit circle. Remember that every point xy on the unit circle corresponds to some angle theta for an angle drawn in standard position. But if we remember that the formula for the unit circle is x squared plus y squared equals 1, and we remember that x corresponds to cosine theta and y corresponds to sine theta, then we can make a substitution to get cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. This gives us another identity. However, the conventional ordering happens to be sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1. The notation for raising trigonometric functions to different powers can be a little bit confusing at first. The reason we write it this way is because sometimes we get lazy and we don't write the parentheses around the angle. If we put the exponent at the end of the function, it would be unclear whether the exponent was being applied to the angle or to the function itself. Fortunately, the notation isn't too difficult to get used to. We can derive two other identities from this one by dividing through by either sine squared theta or cosine squared theta. These formulas are collectively known as the Pythagorean identities. The first one is the most important one to know because the others can be derived from it. We will have many uses for these formulas. One of those uses is to verify trigonometric identities. All this means is that we show that two expressions actually represent the same value by performing algebraic manipulations and substitutions. For example, we will verify that 1 plus sine theta times 1 minus sine theta is equal to cosine squared theta. The general approach to these problems is to start from one side of the equation and work our way to the other side. It is usually best to pick the side that looks more complicated and try to move towards the simpler one. In this case, the left side looks like the better place to start. We are only allowed to do basic algebra and make substitutions based on our previous identities. For this problem, the only reasonable starting point is to multiply it out. If you recognize this combination as a difference of squares, you can jump straight to there. Otherwise, just foil out the product of binomials. There are a few different ways to figure out where to go from here, but the simplest one is to use the Pythagorean identity to substitute for the 1. Then the sine squared theta terms cancel out, and we are done. We could also have manipulated the Pythagorean identity on the side, and use the new formula as our substitution to complete the calculation. When you do this, you need to be clear about what substitution you've made, because otherwise it looks like you just wrote down the final answer. Remember that communication is an important element of mathematics. And it really doesn't matter which way you do it, as long as you communicate it effectively. We will verify more trigonometric identities when we start working on analytic trigonometry later on in the course. So far, we have looked at trigonometric functions from the perspective of the unit circle and with right triangles. We can also look at the trigonometric functions using almost any point on the plane. Draw any angle in standard position and let xy be some point on the terminal side. If we let r be defined as the distance from the point to the origin, then we have these formulas for the six trigonometric functions. Notice that r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. Notice how similar these are to the original equations from the unit circle. In fact, if r equals 1, then we get exactly the same formulas back again. Furthermore, if the point is in the first quadrant, then we can draw a right triangle like this and use the triangle definitions and see that everything matches up perfectly.
Later on, we'll see how to connect these ideas to triangles in all four quadrants. We will focus on the three primary trigonometric functions for a bit, since the others are just the reciprocals of these. From the formulas, we can actually determine whether the functions will be positive or negative depending on the quadrant that the angle is in. We did a bit of practice with this when we constructed the special values on the unit circle, but it's an exercise that's worth repeating. In the first quadrant, both the x and y coordinates are positive, which means that the sine, cosine, and tangent functions will all be positive. In the second quadrant, the x-coordinate is negative and the y-coordinate is positive, which means that only the sine function will be positive. In the third quadrant, both the x and y-coordinates are negative, which means that only the tangent function is positive. And in the fourth quadrant, the x-coordinate is positive and the y-coordinate is negative, which means that only the cosine function is positive. Putting this all together, we have a complete chart of information about the signs of these functions. This can feel a little bit overwhelming, but it's not so bad. If you just remember these formulas and think things through, you will be able to derive the answer. However, there's also a mnemonic device that's fairly common. All students take calculus. What this means is that all the functions in the first quadrant are positive, sine is positive in the second quadrant, tangent is positive in the third quadrant, and cosine is positive in the fourth quadrant. In the next video, we will spend some time creating connections between right triangles and angles outside the first quadrant. In the previous video, we saw how the formulas for the trigonometric functions using a point on the terminal side of an angle corresponds to the right triangle definitions in the first quadrant. In this video, we're going to extend the connection even further and connect the definitions to all four quadrants. For any point x, y in the plane and not on one of the axes, we can define an angle theta in standard position. Here's what it looks like in each of the four quadrants. Using the point, we can also create a right triangle using the x-axis as one of the legs and the line connecting the point to the origin as the hypotenuse. The angle of this triangle at the origin is what we call the reference angle. We will denote it using the Greek letter rho, which is the Greek letter r even though it kind of looks like a p. Notice that rho is always measured relative to the x-axis and never the y-axis because rho is inside the triangle. Furthermore, it's always an acute angle. Using these diagrams, we can use simple geometry to determine the reference angles. There are formulas you can memorize, but it is much better to be able to use logic to arrive at your answers. It's just a matter of thinking about how the angles add or subtract to get an easily identifiable angle. Once we've identified the reference angle, we can then get the values of the trigonometric functions by using that angle. For example, let's look at an angle in the second quadrant. From this angle, we can create a triangle just as we described. The triangle that we have created is just a mirror image of a triangle in the first quadrant. Specifically, it is a reflection across the y-axis. This means that the y-value would stay the same, but the x-value changes signs. The key idea here is that we can always relate everything back to an angle in the first quadrant, and then just change the signs to get the values in the appropriate quadrant. This gives us a useful geometric way of thinking about the trigonometric functions. As a numerical example, let's look at the angle that passes through the point negative 4, negative 7. Here's what our triangle would look like with the reference angle labeled. If we reflect this angle into the first quadrant, we can identify the sine, cosine, and tangent of the reference angle using the Pythagorean theorem to get the length of the third side, and then using the geometric relationships of opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse. We just need to remember that the tangent is the only positive primary trigonometric function in the third quadrant. We could actually do the same thing with the original triangle, but we would have to work with the idea of signed distances, which means that we would have to allow for negative distances. This can be made to work, but it can be a bit confusing and prone to error. It also turns out that reference angles have other uses that we will see later on in the class, so it's worth taking the time now to develop some of those core concepts. We have now seen several different approaches to calculating the value of the trigonometric functions. In the next video, we will add one more.
We have examined three approaches to calculating trigonometric functions, the unit circle, right triangles, and using general points on the plane. There is one other method that we need to address, which is the algebraic approach. In order to do this, we need to remember our reciprocal identities, the quotient identity, and the Pythagorean identities. We also need to remember the signs of the functions based on the quadrant that the angle is in. Everything from here is a matter of logic and algebra. Example, suppose theta is in the third quadrant and that cosine of theta is negative one-third. Determine the values of the other trigonometric functions using algebraic methods. Knowing that the angle is in the third quadrant, we already know the signs of all the functions. Only tangent and cotangent will be positive. We now need to use our algebraic methods to get their values. First, we need to think about our formulas. We have to identify the values we know and find formulas that can give us information about the other functions. For example, knowing that secant is the reciprocal of cosine means that we know that secant theta is negative three. The Pythagorean identity relates the sine and cosine functions together. By plugging in the value for cosine theta and solving for sine theta, we see that it must either be two square root of two over three or negative two square root of two over three. But since we know that we're in the third quadrant, we know that the sine is going to be negative. From here, we can also get cosecant theta by taking the reciprocal of sine theta, and then we can get tangent theta by taking the ratio of sine theta over cosine theta, and lastly get cotangent theta by taking the reciprocal of tangent theta. There are times when we aren't going to be given the specific quadrant that the angle is in. This will require us to employ some higher level reasoning skills. For example, if we know that sine theta is negative, but tangent theta is positive, what quadrant must the angle be located in? Knowing that sine theta is negative, we know that the angle must either be in quadrant three or quadrant four. And knowing that tangent theta is positive, we know that the angle must either be in quadrant one or quadrant three. Therefore, we can conclude that the angle must be in quadrant three. As you can see, there's more to this than just memorizing formulas. You must also understand the relationships between the various pieces of information. We will run into these ideas again in the future, so it is best to come to a solid understanding of them as soon as possible. In this video, we're going to look at the graphs of the sine and cosine functions. In order to do this, we're going to go back to the unit circle. In an earlier section, we saw how the values of sine and cosine correspond to points on the unit circle. We eventually arrived at this picture. We use this image to create a chart of sine and cosine values. Recall that the values of the sine function correspond to the y coordinates, and the values of the cosine function correspond to the x coordinates. Notice that we're using the radian measure for these angles. Radians are the more natural unit of measure for sine and cosine functions. We're now going to use this image to make an extended version of the chart you memorized earlier. The original chart only covered the first quadrant. But by tracking the coordinates all the way around the circle, we can create a chart that covers all four quadrants. We only need to create the chart for angles from 0 to 2 pi because the points on the unit circle start repeating. Once we have the chart, we can think of the angle as the independent variable to get a graph. This transition can sometimes get confusing because we're going to use the variable x for both the independent variable of the graph, and we're also going to think about x as the coordinate on the unit circle corresponding to cosine. You're going to have to rely on the context and your experiences to guide you forward. Let's start with the sine curve. If we plot all these points, we can see that we get an oscillating curve. And after we get these values plotted, we can use the fact that the graph repeats every 2 pi to fill out the rest of it. Recall that if a function repeats itself, we say that it is periodic and the period is the size of the gap between the repetitions. So the sine function is periodic with period two pi. And because it's a periodic function, we can focus our attention on just the interval from zero to two pi. There are several features that we need to pay attention to. The first is that the curve is constrained between plus and minus one in the vertical direction. This is because it comes from points on the unit circle and no point on the unit circle can have a coordinate greater than one or less than negative one. The most important features of the graph are the x-intercepts, the peaks, and the valleys. We call these key values. Notice that you arrive at a new key value every pi over two, and the y-coordinates at these key values is either zero or plus or minus one. 
We can put these points into a simple chart. This chart will become important over the next couple videos. We can follow the same process to get the cosine graph. You will notice that this graph has a lot of the same features. The y-coordinate is always between plus or minus 1, the key values occur every pi over 2, and this allows us to create another key value chart. You might have also noticed that the graphs of the sine and cosine function look very similar. A little bit of inspection will reveal that the cosine functions have the exact same values as the sine function, just shifted over a little bit. We'll see more about this in a future video, but it turns out that this is simply due to the fact that both these graphs come out of points on the unit circle, and the unit circle is perfectly symmetric. In the next video, we're going to start to learn how transformations can affect the shapes of these curves. You might recall graphing by transformations from an earlier math class. The most common application is to parabolas, where you will have to do some combination of vertical and horizontal shifting, as well as perhaps vertical stretching and vertical flipping. The same ideas can be applied to sine and cosine functions to get transformed versions of them. The most general forms we will be looking at involve both vertical and horizontal shifting, as well as both vertical and horizontal stretching and flipping. If you need to refresh your memory about transformations, you're encouraged to go to desmos.com and use their slider functions to create interactive graphs that can remind you about the behaviors of graphs under transformations. Before we get into the details of that, we want to take a moment to talk about the features of the graphs that we will be focusing on. The first is the period of the function. A function is periodic if it repeats itself in regular intervals. For example, we've seen that both the sine and cosine functions are periodic with period 2 pi. As the graphs get transformed, the period might change. One way we can keep track of the period is through the fundamental period. The fundamental period is the interval on which the argument of the sine or cosine function ranges from 0 to 2 pi. As the horizontal shifting and stretching is applied, the fundamental period will shift and stretch as well. However, it will always encompass exactly one period of the functions. And by keeping track of this, we will always know what the period of the final graph will be. While there are formulas for this, we will be tracking the fundamental period through the chart of key values that we introduced in the previous video. The second feature we will focus on is the midline. The midline is just the line that cuts the sine or cosine function in half vertically. This line holds a lot of meaning in applications. It can represent the average value of the function, or it can represent an equilibrium. Regardless of the interpretation of this line, it is primarily impacted by the vertical shifts. The last feature we will focus on is the amplitude. The amplitude is a measure of how far up and down the curve's vibrations are. More precisely, the amplitude is the distance from the midline of the graph to either the maximum or the minimum. The standard sine and cosine functions have an amplitude of 1. As the graph is stretched vertically, the amplitude may increase or decrease. Over the next several videos, we will learn how to graph these transformations of sine and cosine functions. We will start by analyzing the fundamental period. The fundamental period of a sine or cosine function is the interval on which the argument ranges from 0 to 2 pi. Recall that the argument of a function is the content inside the parentheses of the function. By determining the location of the fundamental period, we can know everything we need to know about the horizontal shift and stretch of the function. While it's possible to determine this in its most general form, it's such an easy calculation that memorizing the formula simply isn't worth the effort. We're not interested in just the beginning and the end of the fundamental period. We also want to be able to break the fundamental period into four equal pieces. The reason for this is that the key values are evenly spaced across the fundamental period. Fortunately, breaking an interval into four pieces is just a matter of breaking it in half and then breaking each half in half again. The midpoint of an interval is just the average of the endpoints, so this is a simple calculation to execute. It will be best to view these calculations through an example. Example, determine the fundamental period and the subintervals of the function y equals 2 cosine 2x minus pi minus 1. The argument of the cosine function is 2x minus pi, so we will set this equal to 0 and 2 pi 
and solve them both for x. This shows us that the fundamental period is the interval pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. We now need to break this interval into four equal pieces. We will start by finding the midpoint, which is the sum of the endpoints divided by 2. Then we can find the midpoints of each of these new intervals by averaging the endpoints of each one. With practice and experience, you will be able to do this mentally. But it is a good practice to write out these calculations completely, at least for the first several times. These values will be very important for helping us to graph the functions. However, this will have to wait for a couple more videos. A couple videos ago, we looked at the charts of key values for the sine and cosine functions. These charts give us the primary features that are helpful for graphing them. The x-coordinates correspond to the maximum and minimum values as well as the x-intercepts. When these functions are transformed, it turns out that we can graph them by simply focusing on the key values. Here is the process. Step 1. Identify the fundamental period. Step 2. Use the fundamental period to identify the x-coordinates of the key values. Step 3. Transform the corresponding y-coordinates. Step 4. Plot the points and sketch the graph. We will work through these steps using an example. Example. Graph y equals negative 2 sine of 2x minus pi over 2 plus 3. We discussed steps 1 and 2 in the previous video. As a reminder, to get the fundamental period, you must set the argument equal to 0 and 2 pi and then solve for the variable. This gives us x equals pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4. We then break the fundamental period into four equal parts by finding the midpoint of the fundamental period and then the midpoints of the two intervals that we just created. The midpoint between pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4 is 3 pi over 4. The midpoint of the left interval is 2 pi over 4, or pi over 2, and the midpoint of the right interval is 4 pi over 4, or just pi. These five values become the new x-coordinates of the key values. Transforming the y-coordinates is a matter of simply plugging in values. Technically, you are substituting in the values x1 through x5, but there's a shortcut that we can use. When you plug in the key values, the sine and cosine functions evaluate to negative 1, 0, or 1, corresponding to the base function. So to transform the y-coordinates, we replace the entire sine or cosine function with the appropriate value, and then perform a short calculation. For the first key value, the location is the midline, so the sine function evaluates to 0. And when we replace the entire sine term with 0, we get 3. This means that the y-coordinate for the first key value in the transformed function is 3. For the second key value, the sine term is 1, corresponding to the peak. And when we make the substitution and evaluate the value, we get 1. We can continue this process for the rest of the values and plug these numbers into the chart. Lastly, we plot the points and sketch the graph. When setting up the graph, it is important that the axes are chosen well. We want to pick a spacing in both directions that makes sense for the points that we need to graph. In this case, we have an x spacing of pi over 4 that we will need to work with, so we will make sure our graph is set up that way. For the y direction, we can make each step one unit. And now we can plot the points. It is useful to draw the midline at this time for visualization purposes. These points help us to graph the curve in the fundamental period, but since the function is periodic, we can extend the pattern. This will give us the shape of the graph beyond the fundamental period. We will work through a couple more examples in the next video, and then we will work with the general theory of transformations for a bit. In this video, we're just going to work through a couple examples of graphing using key values. Remember that the steps to graphing using key values are as follows. Step 1. Identify the fundamental period. Step 2. Use the fundamental period to identify the x-coordinates of the key values. Step 3. Transform the corresponding y-coordinates. Step 4. Plot the points and sketch the graph. Example. Graph the function y equals 3 cosine of x minus pi over 4 minus 1. We will start with a quick reminder of the chart of key values for the basic cosine function. 
As we start to work our way through these steps, we're going to be creating another chart like this one, except specific to the function we're graphing. The argument of the cosine function is x minus pi over 4, and we will find the fundamental period by setting this equal to 0 and 2 pi. When we solve these equations, we get that the fundamental period is the interval pi over 4 to 9 pi over 4. We can now break this interval into pieces. We first find the midpoint of the interval, and then we find the midpoints of the new intervals that we just created. Remember that we can calculate the midpoint of an interval by averaging the endpoints. We now need to transform the y-coordinates. This is just a matter of substituting the values negative 1, 0, or 1 into the cosine function. The values we use correspond to the values in the basic cosine chart. Notice that since we're substituting this into the cosine term, we will always be multiplying by 3 and then subtracting 1. Lastly, we plot the points and then graph. We will draw in the midline because it is visually helpful. Remember that these points only give us the fundamental period, but then we can repeat the shape to get the entire graph. You will notice that in this example, our labels and graph are on top of each other in a way that isn't the most visually appealing. This happens sometimes. It's technically correct, so you can just leave it. But if you wanted to make it look nicer, here are two things that you can do. Move some of the x-axis markings above the axis. Reduce the number of x-axis markings. It is important that if you do the second one, you still maintain a consistent spacing. Here's an example of what might go wrong. The internal spacing between the key values is consistent, but the spacing outside isn't. The first two grid markings together are a distance of pi over 4, but beyond that point, two grid markings represent a distance of pi over 2. When you start dropping your x-axis markings, you need to make sure that your grid spacing remains consistent. We will do one more example. Example, graph the function y equals negative 2 sine of 2x plus pi over 2 plus 2. Here is the chart of key values for the sine function. We calculate the fundamental period by setting the argument equal to 0 and 2 pi, which gives us the interval from negative pi over 4 to 3 pi over 4. We now break this interval into four equal pieces. The midpoint of the fundamental period is pi over 4. From here, we can see that the midpoint of the new intervals are at 0 and pi over 2. We then substitute the sine function with the y-coordinates to transform them. Notice that for all of these, we will multiply by negative 2 and then add 2. And then we will plot the points, draw the midline, and sketch the graph. In the next video, we will go into the theory of graphing by transformations to see what's actually happening in the background. Given a function f of x, you can apply transformations to get a new function g of x. The two types of transformations we will focus on are shifting and stretching. In order to help make things concrete, we're going to look at a specific function f of x known as the triangle wave. The reason we choose this function is that it shares a lot of features with the sine and cosine functions, but its reference points are integer values, and it can be drawn using straight lines. Shifting transformations, also known as translations, come from adding or subtracting a number from either the entire function or the argument of the function. If it happens inside the argument, then it corresponds to a horizontal shift, and if it happens to the entire function, it corresponds to a vertical shift. Students often make mistakes because the horizontal transformations are opposite what we might guess. If c is a positive number, then f of x minus c shifts the graphs to the right and not to the left. To see why this happens, let's look at a chart of values for x and x minus 1. Notice that the x minus 1 values are shifted to the right. This means that when we evaluate the function, those values will also be shifted to the right. Vertical shifts don't have this behavior because you're transforming the graph after it has read the values from the function, so adding and subtracting values directly increases or decreases the final result. Horizontal and vertical stretching comes from multiplying either the entire function or the argument by some value. Just as with shifting, the horizontal stretching works opposite our intuitive guess. Again, it comes from changing the values where you're reading the values from when evaluating the function. Multiplying by 2 before evaluating the function means that you're reading values twice as far from the origin. If the value is negative, then we also reflect off the x or y axis, depending on whether the transformation is horizontal or vertical.
It is important that these transformations are always performed relative to the x-axis or the y-axis and not relative to the curve itself. This is the source of many mistakes when working on these problems. The most general transformation we can get from these has the form y equals a times f of bx minus c plus d. When graphing by transformations, the order in which the transformations are applied is the following. First, horizontal shift, then horizontal stretch, vertical stretch, and then vertical shift. The order is related to the evaluation of the expression. The reverse order for the horizontal parts matches with the pattern of things being backwards relative to our intuition. In the previous video, we graphed y equals negative 2 sine of 2x plus pi over 2 plus 2. We will now show how this looks when we graph it using transformations and see that both end up with the same result. We start with the graph of the sine function. The graph is then shifted to the left by pi over 2. Then we stretch the graph horizontally by a factor of 1 half. The negative 2 out front flips the graph vertically and then stretches it by a factor of 2. And lastly, we shift it vertically by 2 units. And we can see that this gives us the exact same result. I encourage students to use key values instead of transformations for these functions because it's easy to make mistakes on the horizontal transformations. Students often anchor the horizontal stretch to a point on the graph instead of the y-axis. I have found that students find the key values to be a little bit more straightforward and they make fewer mistakes. Before we graph the tangent function, we're going to look at some general graphing techniques. Specifically, we're going to focus on the locations of zeros and asymptotes. These ideas are usually covered when graphing rational functions, so we won't go into the full detail here. Suppose we have a function of the form f of x equals n of x over d of x, where we've cancelled out all the common factors. The zeros of f of x correspond to the zeros of the numerator n of x, and the vertical asymptotes correspond to the zeros of the denominator d of x. For example, consider the graph of f of x equals x minus 2 times x plus 3 divided by 3 times x plus 1 quantity squared. The numerator is 0 at x equals 2 and x equals negative 3, which is where we have zeros of the function. And the denominator is 0 at x equals negative 1, which is where we have a vertical asymptote. Since tangent of x is equal to sine of x over cosine of x, we can apply these ideas to get a reasonable sketch of the graph. We will start with the zeros. The zeros of tangent of x will be the zeros of sine of x. These happen at 0, plus or minus pi, plus or minus 2 pi, plus or minus 3 pi, and so on. So we will plot these zeros for the tangent function. The asymptotes of tangent of x will be at the zeros of cosine of x. These happen at plus or minus pi over 2, plus or minus 3 pi over 2, plus or minus 5 pi over 2, and so on. We will draw vertical dashed lines to represent the vertical asymptotes for the tangent graph. To determine whether we are approaching positive or negative infinity at the asymptotes, we need to think about whether the sine and cosine functions are positive or negative on each interval. Because the sine and cosine functions are periodic with period 2 pi, we will just need to look at the intervals between 0 and 2 pi and can repeat from there. These sketches allow us to quickly see whether each function is positive or negative. For the four subintervals in the sine function, we get positive, positive, negative, negative. For the four subintervals of the cosine function, we get positive, negative, negative, positive. And then the pattern continues for both of these. The first interval is from 0 to pi over 2. Both functions are positive here, so we know that the graph will approach positive infinity on the left side of pi over 2. On the interval pi over 2 to pi, sine is positive but cosine is negative, which means that the tangent will be negative, and so the graph will approach negative infinity from the right side of pi over 2. We can continue this logic to fill out the rest of the graph. From this information, we can get a rough sense of the shape of the tangent function. Notice that the tangent function is periodic with period pi instead of period 2 pi. In fact, the fundamental period for tangent is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. We would say that this is one branch of the tangent function. Here's the chart of key values for the tangent function. Notice that the values at plus or minus pi over 2 are undefined. This is just a reminder that you have asymptotes there. Once we have the key values, we can graph the transformed versions of the tangent functions using the same techniques as we used for the sine and cosine functions. The only difference is that when determining our fundamental period, we will set the argument equal to plus or minus pi over 2 because that's the fundamental period for the tangent function. Example, 
graph y equals 2 times tangent of x over 2 minus pi minus 2. We set the argument equal to plus or minus pi over 2 and solve for x. This shows us that the fundamental period is from pi to 3 pi. The midpoint of this interval is 2 pi, and the midpoints of the new intervals are 3 pi over 2 and 5 pi over 2. We can now take the y coordinates and substitute to get the transformed values. We multiply the base values by 2 and then subtract 2. This gives us points and asymptotes that we can plot and use to sketch the graph. Lastly, we can use periodicity to graph the other branches of the function. These reference points don't correspond to well-defined features as they do for the sine and cosine functions. Because of this, it is especially important that they are graphed carefully and labeled so that it's clear that you know what you're doing. In the next video, we will talk about graphing reciprocals of functions and use that to graph the cotangent function. To determine the graph of the cotangent function, we can follow the same process that we did for the tangent function. However, we're going to use this opportunity to explore graphing reciprocals of functions. Graphing reciprocals is not difficult, but it does require a little bit of thought to understand it. Before we can get into the graphs, we just need to think about reciprocals in general. The reciprocal of x is 1 over x. If x is very large, then its reciprocal is very small. And if x is very small, then its reciprocal is very large. Specifically, if x is greater than 1, then the reciprocal is between 0 and 1, and if x is between 0 and 1, then its reciprocal is greater than 1. Negative values behave similarly. The only values that remain unchanged when you take the reciprocal are plus and minus 1. When it comes to graphing reciprocal functions, we have another property to add that is just an extension of this. If f of x has a 0 at some point, then the reciprocal function has an asymptote there. And if f of x has an asymptote, then the reciprocal has a zero. With these ideas in mind, we can now graph the reciprocal functions. The cotangent function is the reciprocal of the tangent function. So we will start with the tangent function. First, we will copy the relevant information from the graph onto a number line. We need to keep track of the locations of zeros and asymptotes, as well as keep track of whether the tangent is positive or negative on the various intervals. We will now make space on the graph to draw the cotangent function. We need to turn all the asymptotes of the tangent function into zeros and all the zeros into asymptotes. This information can then be placed on the graph. The numbers plus and minus 1 are fixed points under the reciprocal, so we will mark these as well. To determine the behavior of the cotangent function near its asymptotes, we just need to look at whether the tangent function is positive or negative there. Since taking the reciprocal does not change the signs, this will tell us whether the function is approaching positive or negative infinity. Once we have all of this information, we can create the graph by simply connecting all these ideas together. This has a very similar shape to the tangent function, except that it has been flipped and shifted. It is important that you recognize the steps involved when graphing the cotangent function as the reciprocal of the tangent function. Specifically, you need to understand how the roles of zeros and asymptotes switch with each other, that signs don't change, and that plus and minus one are fixed points. The fundamental cycle for the cotangent function is 0 to pi, and here is the chart of key values. The process of graphing transformed versions of the cotangent function is similar to the process we've already developed and practiced for the sine, cosine, and tangent functions. Example, graph y equals negative 2 cotangent of x over 4. We first determine the fundamental period by setting the argument equal to 0 and pi. This shows us that the fundamental period will be the interval from 0 to 4 pi. We break this into subintervals and get that the key values will have x coordinates 0, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and 4 pi. We can then calculate the y coordinates by substituting for the trigonometric function. And then we can put these pieces together to get the graph. As you can see from this video and the previous one, the technique of graphing using key values extends beyond just the sine and cosine functions. We've now seen how to graph both the tangent and cotangent functions using the exact same ideas. The fundamental periods are different, and the shapes of the graphs are different, but the ideas carry forward. In the next video, we will look at the graphs of the secant and cosecant functions.
The secant and cosecant functions are just the reciprocals of the cosine and sine functions, so we can apply the same type of analysis as we did to the cotangent function to get their graphs. Since the graphs are simpler this time, we won't go through as many steps as we did for the cotangent function. Here are the graphs of the cosine and sine functions. The zeros of the cosine and sine functions turned into asymptotes for the secant and cosecant functions. There are no asymptotes for the cosine and sine functions, so we have no zeros for the secant and cosecant functions. Also, the peaks and valleys of the sine and cosine function are at height plus or minus one, so these points stay fixed when we look at the reciprocals. We'll mark those points and grow out the cosine and sine functions in preparation for graphing the secant and cosecant functions. Recall that we determine whether the reciprocal function is approaching positive or negative infinity by the signs of the original functions. This process will give us the graphs of the secant and cosecant functions. While we could use key values for the secant and cosecant functions to graph transformations, it turns out that we have a helpful heuristic based on the sine and cosine graphs that is a little bit easier to use. The basic idea is that the cosine and secant functions and the sine and cosecant functions transform together. As the zeros of the cosine and sine functions move around, so do the asymptotes of the secant and cosecant functions. As the cosine and sine functions are stretched and shifted vertically, the secant and cosecant functions move with them. This is best understood through an example. Example, graph y equals two secant of two x plus pi plus one. To graph this function, we start by graphing the corresponding cosine function, y equals two cosine of two x plus pi plus one. If you need to review these steps, you are encouraged to watch the previous videos, which go through these steps a little more slowly. Just as before, we determine the fundamental period and the x-coordinates of our key values. We can then substitute the y-coordinates into the formula to get the transformed y-values. This gives us all the information we need to graph the cosine function. To get the secant graph, we first draw the asymptotes through the points where the midline crosses the cosine function. The peaks and valleys of the cosine function become reference points for the secant function. And now we use what we know about the shape of the secant function to sketch the graph. It is important to understand that this works because the two graphs transform together. We are not actually graphing the cosine function and then inverting it to get the secant function. If we did this, the formula and the graph would look quite different. The inversion step actually happens before the vertical stretching and shifting, so we're simply using the cosine function as a reference for the secant function. The same process would work for graphing the transformed cosecant function, except that you would graph a sine function instead of a cosine function as your starting point. Your ability to graph the secant and cosecant functions will greatly depend on your ability to graph the cosine and sine functions. This is another example of how mathematics builds new ideas on top of old ones. If you are struggling with graphing these functions, you might want to go back and review the previous couple sections to make sure that you have a solid foundation to build on. A function is a mapping from one collection of objects to another. In pre-calculus courses, this is usually done as functions that take real numbers as their input and return real numbers as their output. For example, f of x equals x squared is a function. It maps the number 2 to the number 4 and the number negative 1 to the number positive 1. We can represent this using an arrow diagram. An arrow diagram is a tool to help conceptualize what's happening with a function. The region on the left represents the domain, which is the set of valid input values for the function. Notice that the displayed values are not comprehensive. We are simply using this as a conceptual tool. The region on the right is the codomain, which is the set of possible output values. What makes this a function is that every value in the domain maps to exactly one value in the codomain. If any of the values in the domain have two arrows leaving it, the resulting diagram would not represent a function. Notice that not every output value gets mapped to by this function. For example, there is no input value that can ever make x squared equal to negative one. The range of a function is the collection of values in the codomain that are mapped to by some value in the domain. The inverse attempts to ask the question, given an output value, what input could it have come from? For example, to find the inverse of one under this mapping, we would trace these arrows backwards to see that both plus and minus one map to one. This is the essence of the inverse question.
From this, we see that the inverse is the mapping you get when you swap the domain and codomain and turn all the arrows around. Notice that the inverse is not necessarily a function because some numbers may have two or more arrows leaving it. When this happens, we sometimes have to make a decision to restrict our range in order to eliminate the extra arrows. This is what happens with the square root function. When we take the square root of a number, we always choose the non-negative value. This is why we explicitly have to include a plus or minus when we solve equations. We may also need to remove values that were never mapped to in the first place. For example, we would eliminate negative 1 from the domain of the inverse because there are no arrows leaving it at all. This is basically what we mean when we say we can't take the square root of a negative number. When we look at the graph of a function, the variable x represents the input and the variable y represents the output. The act of swapping the input and output is the same as swapping the x and the y variables. Graphically, this is reflecting across the line y equals x. For example, here's the graph of the function f of x equals x squared. When we look at the inverse, we get this picture. In order to make this into a function, we restrict the inverse to just the non-negative values. And this is how we get the graph of the square root function. In the next video, we will see how these concepts apply to trigonometric functions. We will apply the concepts of inverse functions to the sine, cosine, and tangent functions. Here's the extended chart of values for these functions. We have put it into a chart instead of an arrow diagram to save space, but the information is still the same. Let's take a moment to focus on the sine chart. Remember that the inverse asks the question, given an output value, what input value could it have come from? We'll focus on a specific value. If sine of theta is equal to square root of 3 over 2, then what can we know about theta? By looking at the chart, we can see that pi over 3 and 2 pi over 3 are both possible values of theta. But because of the periodicity of the sine function, we know that if we add or subtract multiples of 2 pi to these, we will get even more values. This means that the inverse isn't going to be a function unless we restrict the range. In this case, it turns out that the interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 is the natural choice. So when we ask what is the inverse sine of the square root of 3 over 2, the answer will be pi over 3. We can look at the cosine and tangent charts in the same way. When looking at the cosine chart, the interval of 0 to pi turns out to be the most natural range to pick. For the tangent function, we restrict ourselves to the open interval negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. We have grayed out a couple values from the tangent function because they aren't actually defined at plus or minus pi over 2, but those endpoints are still important values to know. To get the inverse functions, we simply swap the rows in our restricted charts. We could also rearrange the rows to put the x values in increasing order, but we'll leave it in this form for now. Let's look at this graphically. This is the graph of the sine function. Recall that the graph of the inverse is the graph that we get when we reflect across the line y equals x. This will result in a curve that vibrates left and right as it goes up the y-axis. Notice that this fails the vertical line test, so it's not a function. But by restricting the range to the interval negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, we get a graph that does represent a function. This is the same effect as restricting the chart of values from earlier. Looking at the cosine function, we see that the inverse has the same back and forth behavior as a sine function, so we will also need to restrict the range. From the picture, it makes a little more intuitive sense why we pick the range as we do. It has to do with finding a piece of the graph that can pass the vertical line test. There are other pieces that we could have picked, but notice how those values end up being further away from the origin or negative. So the choice of the range of the inverse cosine is in this sense the natural choice. The inverse tangent function is different because it extends from negative to positive infinity. We still have the problem of repeated values, so we will restrict the inverse to just the connected piece that passes through the origin. The important idea to get out of this video is that all of these steps are really trying to define a function that can answer the question, given an output value, what input value could it have come from? If you keep focused on this question, you will find inverse functions to be less confusing. In the next video, we're going to look at a geometric interpretation of the inverse trigonometric functions.
We've talked about the inverse trigonometric functions from a purely functional perspective, but it's also important to understand them from the geometric perspective of right triangles. The inverse function attempts to answer the question, given an output value, what input value could it have come from? We can reinterpret this question specifically for trigonometry by asking, given a trigonometric function, what triangle could it have come from? This makes the most sense by working through an example. Example, use a triangle to represent the inverse cosine of 3 fifths. What triangle can we draw so that the cosine of some angle is 3 fifths? Let's just look at a generic right triangle, and let's let theta represent the unknown angle. Since the cosine of an angle is adjacent over hypotenuse, we could just label the adjacent side 3 and the hypotenuse 5. This gives us a perfectly valid representation of an angle theta such that cosine of theta is 3 fifths. But once we have this picture, we can then go further and compute the trigonometric functions of this angle. Recall that if we know two of the sides of a right triangle, we can use the Pythagorean theorem to calculate the length of the third side. Also, once we have all three sides of the triangle, we can compute any of the six trigonometric functions relative to the angle. Example. Compute tangent of the inverse sine of 5 sevenths. For notation, we will let theta equal the inverse sine of 5 sevenths. In other words, theta is the angle such that sine of theta is 5 sevenths. So we draw our generic triangle and label the sides accordingly. We now compute the length of the third side using the Pythagorean theorem. Tangent is opposite over adjacent, and so we have everything we need to complete the calculation. These calculations are actually old ideas that we've covered before, just put together in a brand new way. We've been working with the right triangle picture of the trigonometric functions for a while. The new approach is that instead of being given the triangle, we're creating it from given information. As we continue further into this class, we will keep returning back to these core ideas, but we'll continue to see them from new and different perspectives. To solve a triangle means to determine some or all of the unknown sides and angles of the triangle. We will be focusing our attention on solving right triangles. When labeling the sides and the angles, we often use capital letters for the vertices and label the side opposite the angle with the corresponding lowercase letter. For a generic right triangle, there are two unknown angles and three unknown sides. However, there are mathematical relationships that relate some of these values together. For example, we know that the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees, so we can write one of the angles in terms of the other. Similarly, the Pythagorean theorem tells us that if we know the lengths of any two of the sides, we can calculate the length of the third side. We also have trigonometric relationships that relate one of the angles with two of the sides, so if we know any two of those values, we can calculate the third. It turns out that if we know the length of one side and one other piece of information in the right triangle, we can calculate the lengths of all the sides and calculate all the angles. This is a matter of problem solving. Based on the picture, you have to determine which relationships you're going to use. And there may be many ways forward, but as long as your steps are valid, you will get the right answer. Example, solve the right triangle for all the unknown sides and angles. When working with these triangles, sometimes you will see the units explicitly listed and sometimes you won't. It's up to you to recognize that in this context, the number 7 refers to a length. It could be 7 inches, 7 centimeters, 7 miles, or some other unit. We would generically say that the side is 7 units in length. When it comes to word problems, the units will be specified in the problem, and you might need to do some unit conversions. But for this problem, we simply know that it's 7 units in length, and we can proceed from here. Let's start by determining the size of the third angle. Since the sum of the angles is 180 degrees, we can see that B is equal to 70 degrees. In fact, the two acute angles will always be complements of each other in a right triangle. Let's solve for the second leg. We can either use angle A or angle B. In general, it's best to try to relate things back to the information given in the original problem. This helps to minimize the chances that you make compound errors. For example, if we had calculated angle B incorrectly, and then use that angle to calculate the length of the leg, then there's no way that we would get the right answer. 
so we will use the tangent of angle A to determine the length of the second leg. Tangent is opposite over adjacent, and we can solve for B to get 7 over tangent of 20 degrees. At this point, we can get a numerical approximation by plugging this into a calculator. Different classes treat significant figures differently, so we're not going to spend a lot of time worrying about this here. If you keep at least four decimals in these calculations, you should avoid most major rounding errors. Just as a reminder, when using your calculator, make sure that you have it in the right mode. We're working with degrees now, and so it should be in degree mode. There are several ways to determine the length of the hypotenuse. Keeping with the idea that we want to use the given values as much as possible, we can use the sine function with the initial angle. This gives us c is equal to 7 over sine of 20 degrees. There are several other ways to get the answer using our calculated values. In this case, everything happens to round off to four digits and correctly match up. However, there are some situations in which you will find differences in the third or fourth decimal. If you have errors larger than that, you've either made a mistake or you're rounding off too early in your calculations. You will want to be aware of this so that when you compare your answers with other students, you can have a sense of whether it's just a rounding error or something more. In the next video, we will learn some specialized vocabulary in preparation for solving right triangle word problems. Students tend to have a lot of difficulties with word problems. They usually aren't hard because of the math, but because of the words. Students tend to have a difficult time translating the words of a word problem into a meaningful picture or idea, which makes it extremely difficult to solve the problem. So before we launch into a video about word problems, we will first talk through some terminology that is used for these word problems. The first two terms are angle of elevation and angle of depression. These words refer to the angle above or below the horizontal. Sometimes, students get a little confused by this one because they draw the angle relative to the slope of the ground instead of the horizontal. For example, if you are on a downhill slope, you will still need to sketch the horizontal before drawing the angle of elevation. Many problems involve motion. Most of the units should be familiar, like meters per second or miles per hour. However, one unit you may see that you might not be familiar with are knots. One knot is one nautical mile per hour. A nautical mile is a minute of arc around the equator, where minutes refer to the degree minute second notation for angles. Fortunately, you should never need to convert out of nautical miles in order to complete the problem, and so you won't need to know any conversions. But just in case you're interested, a nautical mile is approximately 1.15 miles. Another class of terminology relates to navigation and surveying problems. Directions are often given in terms of bearings. There are two different ways this is done, depending on the context. One form of communicating bearings uses north as 0 degrees and increases as you turn clockwise. This means that east is 90 degrees, south is 180 degrees, and west is 270 degrees. So if someone's bearing is 230 degrees, they're facing in a direction between south and west. These bearings are often used with compasses and hiking problems. Another form of communicating bearings is to use either north or south as a reference, and then measure how far to the east or west from that reference they are facing. For example, north 30 degrees east means that you start from north and turn 30 degrees to the east. Another common mistake for these problems is to just plug in angles instead of thinking through the entire direction. For example, suppose we're traveling on a triangular path. We start heading due east, then north 30 degrees west, and then finally south 60 degrees west to return to the starting point. Students often plug in numbers for the angles of the triangle without thinking about the meaning of the words. This leads to all sorts of problems. The bearings given here are relative to the north-south line, so you will need to draw those in and measure the angles from there. There are a couple different angle relationships that will help you to think through these problems and to avoid errors. If you have two parallel lines and a straight line that passes through them, the alternate interior angles are congruent. This arrangement happens often with navigation problems because the north-south line is often used as a reference. We also have that vertical angles and alternate exterior angles are congruent. There will also be times when you will need to add or subtract angles from each other to determine the angle you want.
For example, in this diagram, the angle formed by the terminal sides is 15 degrees. And in this diagram, the total angle is 105 degrees. In the next video, we will work through a word problem that requires you to draw some diagrams and think through some of these relationships. One of the key skills that is often overlooked in a math class is the ability to reason through information. A helpful skill to develop is to sketch a picture to help focus your attention on the important information and important relationships. The best way to become proficient with word problems is through solving word problems. There is no other way to do it. The purpose of this example is more about how you think than it is about the problem itself. The key to most trigonometric word problems is a good diagram. In fact, drawing an accurate diagram is a central step towards solving a wide range of word problems. Example, a boat leaves the dock traveling due east at 25 knots for two hours. It then changes course to north 15 degrees east at 20 knots for another hour. Determine the ship's bearing from the dock. We need to break this problem down into an understandable drawing. We will start from the dock. If the boat travels due east at 25 knots for two hours, it travels a total of 50 nautical miles to the east. Then it starts traveling north 15 degrees east. At this point, it is essential to draw the new bearing correctly. We have to draw the north-south line for reference, and we also need to make sure that we turn 15 degrees to the east and not to the west. At the end of another hour, it has traveled another 20 nautical miles. The ship's bearing from the dock is the bearing of the line that connects the dock to the ship. From what we have, we know that it's going to be north something east. We'll call the unknown angle theta. Notice that this isn't a right triangle, so we can't immediately use our sine, cosine, and tangent functions. Later on, we'll learn some techniques for solving general triangles, but for now, we're constrained to using right triangles. Based on the diagram, this is a helpful right triangle to think about. If we can determine these two distances, then we would be set. The vertical distance can then be attained from this smaller right triangle, and the horizontal distance would be the combination of this distance plus this distance. We want to start working with the smaller triangle. We know the length of the hypotenuse, but nothing else. So we're going to have to take a step back and see what information we have that might be able to help us. We know that this angle is 15 degrees, and we know that we have a right angle here. This means that this angle is 75 degrees. And now we can focus on just the smaller triangle. We can solve for the lengths of the legs of the triangle using sine and cosine. Here are the results. We now take this information and look at our big triangle. Notice that we don't have a label for the angle inside of the triangle, so we will call that alpha. We have the horizontal distance and the vertical distance, so tangent of alpha is equal to 19.3185 divided by 55.1763. Using a calculator, we can determine that alpha is about 19.3 degrees. We're nearly done now. We know that alpha and theta are complementary angles, so theta is 70.7 .7 degrees. This means that the bearing from the dock to the boat is north 70.7 .7 degrees east. This is not an easy problem. It required several steps of logic to solve. Students tend to make mistakes on these problems by plugging in angles into the wrong places. For example, Many students label the entire large angle as being 15 degrees, or they stop at solving for alpha and just declare it to be the answer. Unfortunately, there's no shortcut to avoiding these mistakes. You must be able to draw a picture and carefully label the parts, and then you must correctly reason your way through the information. Watching a word problem is not good enough to learn how to do word problems. You're going to have to work through some yourself. They don't all fit a single form, and you are going to have to practice the skill of problem solving to be successful. Here are two of the problems that we'll be working on in class. Remember that the problem solving method begins with drawing an accurate diagram. After that, you're just going to have to ask yourself what information you're seeking and see how you can get there from where you've started. Each problem is different and will require you to think carefully about the diagram to be successful.
Simple harmonic motion is a specific type of behavior that is modeled either by a sine curve or a cosine curve. For example, a buoy bobbing up and down on the waves of a passing boat could be modeled as simple harmonic motion. We could also try to model the rise and fall of temperature over the course of the day as simple harmonic motion. But the most common picture of simple harmonic motion is the vibration of a mass attached to the end of a spring. These spring mass systems are extremely common in the study of physics. We will start with a picture of the system at rest. You can imagine that we just left it untouched for a long period of time. The current height is known as the equilibrium position of the mass. This is where the force of the spring pulling up is exactly equal to the force of gravity pulling down. Intuitively, if you pull down on the mass and let it go, you expect that it will be pulled up because of the stretch of the spring. But it will probably have some momentum when it reaches its equilibrium height and so will shoot past it. But now the spring is compressed a little bit so it isn't pulling up as much, and now gravity is pulling down on the mass more than the spring is pulling up on it, so it slows down and starts to fall again. And this cycle repeats over and over again. If we chart the position of the mass over time, we get a sine or a cosine curve. There are some features about this curve that are important to know about. The first is the amplitude, which is the maximum displacement from the equilibrium position. Another feature is the period, which is how much time it takes for the motion to repeat itself. One repetition is sometimes called a cycle. The frequency is a measure of how many cycles are completed per second. This value turns out to be the reciprocal of the period. This should make sense intuitively. If the period is very small, then you have many cycles per second. And if the period is very long, you should have a small number of cycles per second. The simplest mathematical models for simple harmonic motion are y equals a sine omega t and y equals a cosine omega t, where omega is a positive number. Under these models, we have these formulas for the amplitude, period, and frequency. If this were a physics course, we would study these formulas in much more detail. For this course, it's good enough for you to know that these formulas exist and that you can look them up if you needed to. It's more important for you to be able to determine the amplitude, period, and frequency by thinking about the graph instead of using formulas. In fact, if you can graph the curve, you actually have all the tools you need to derive these formulas yourself. The amplitude is the distance from the midline to the peaks and valleys, and you can determine the period by calculating the length of the fundamental period. So there really is no need to memorize more formulas.